Hello, hello, everyone. Hey, Julie, how are you doing? Hi, Gregory, doing well, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. I'm quite yellow, I'm trying to figure out why. <laughs> Please check my settings here. Cool, we have a few people. Yeah, awesome. Hey, uh, hey Kyle, how are you doing? I see Kyle Seagraves in there. Yeah, I recognize a few names. Great. Mer Meryl, Meryl's in there, putting me under pressure. <laughs> Mariel and I teach uh, on the bubble boot camps, um, and actually Mariel was a bit of a pioneer in, on the boot camps, which is cool. Hi, Gregory. How are you? Excited yeah. to learn from you. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Awesome. awesome. See, so Luke Muhammad is there. Fantastic. Ah, uh, we have we have James Moore. James, introduce yourself, buddy. I'm not going to let him off. James, uh, James is a friend of mine, um, and I'm actually going to be demonstrating a few concepts of of his in this uh, in this um, in this chat we're having in the session. So uh, he's going to be keeping an eye on me and making sure that I teach things the correct way. Awesome. <laughs> So thanks everybody for, for joining and thank you so much, Gregory, for offering to do this um, for the MakerPad community. I'm really excited about this workshop. Um, Bubble was honestly my first snow code tool, um, which ah. is definitely an overwhelming tool. There's a lot to learn with Bubble, but um, as a software engineer myself, I've been nothing short of amazed at the abilities of Bubble. Um, and so I'm really excited to learn about uh, doing more responsive design in bubble today. Yep. Um, we at MakerPad have the bubble challenge going on this month. Um, so November, you have until November 28th. If you are uh, building something in bubble this month and you want to enter the uh, challenge, the prizes for the challenge are awesome. Um, we have a thousand dollar credit for bubble um, towards pro features. Amazing. Uh, and also an iPad uh, an iPad Air, so that's awesome. Um, and some some great gift cards for uh, second and third prize as well. It's also a great opportunity just to get the word out about any projects that you're building. So uh, please sign up for that on the MakerPad site. I'll link to the challenge um, in the chat. Um, and so today we have an amazing workshop that I'm very much looking forward to with Gregory. Uh, Gregory is a bubble teacher. He's even taught no code tools at Yale. Um, so we're very excited to have Gregory here to, to teach us today. Um, I will be monitoring, monitoring the chat. Um, so if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks yeah, all. Thanks, Gregory. Cool. Thank, thanks for the introduction, Julie. And just feel free to interrupt me whenever you like. Um, it's, it's quite a long session. So we'll take our time uh, and do I still have everyone? Right, I'm back, I think. Am I back? Lost me for a second too, so maybe it was a it was a a zoom glitch. <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right. Let's continue. I'm going to share my screen. Um, just do a quick introduction about myself. Right, so this is me. Um, Julie, can you just give me a thumbs up if everything is as it should be? All good. Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right. I'll keep an eye on the connection as well. I've, uh, I've moved to the countryside recently, um, but uh, it's taken me a while to, to, get, to get the Wi-Fi back up to city living, but I think I'm almost there. But anyway, this is me. Um, I've been, I was having a look back at my, my Bubble account recently, and uh, I first signed up to Bubble in 2015. So it's been, it's been quite a while. Um, and I, I discovered uh, because I was trying to scratch an itch. I was learning Ruby on Rails. I was an accepted to an accelerator program. Um, 
uh, in 2016. 2015, I was playing with Bubble. 2016, I didn't think Bubble was quite the solution what I was looking for in terms of what it could do and functionality. So I was in the midst of teaching myself Ruby on Rails. And I remember applying to some accelerators and didn't think I'd get into any. Uh, but magically, I got asked for further interviews. Um, and I got accepted to this accelerator with very limited knowledge to Ruby and Rails. So I thought, let me jump back into Bubble and just have one more, one more look, because I'm in a in a tight uh, a, a tight pocket here. So, so, so basically, what happened is went through this accelerator program, had to learn Bubble very, very quickly. I was lucky enough to be able to do it to get funding to do it uh, every day. So I learned by doing. Um, there are a few people on the forum back then that would help me out as I was learning, but I was learning in a really rapid rate under this pressure, under this time constraint. And I think learning under time constraints is fantastic because it kind of forces you to focus um, on what really needs to be done. So after that accelerated program, raised money from a VC to continue this idea I had, which was a marketplace. We all know that marketplaces are quite popular. I believe the most popular course in MakerPad is a marketplace uh, in Bubble. And yeah, so I built this marketplace. We became a profitable company in 2016, sorry, in 2017, mid of 2017. And this, continu this company continued for a while until we ran out of funding and our metrics weren't quite, uh, we weren't scaling fast enough and we decided to can that project. Uh, and I decided, decided to start coaching and teaching other founders how to do a similar thing. Go from being a non-technical founder to a technical, technical founder. Um, so since then, I've been coaching uh, and I've been working with real companies using Bubble. Um, I started doing uh, tutorials and courses in 20, towards the end of 2017, 2018, early 2018. But I decided, look, who am I to teach other people this technology if I haven't actually used it in a real company? So I decided to disappear for two years uh, and I was just working for real profitable companies using no-code tools. Now I've come back uh, and I'm a bit more social. I've just launched uh, buildcamp.io, which is a bubble based community of which I'm going to be scaling next year. And that's going to be like a learning community courses. We'll be running build camps, which is my new take on a boot camp, basically. But it, the focus is really on bubble. Um, I've also been working alongside in the last year, a fantastic guy called Dom Jackman at his startup. It's probably borderline an SME size now. They've been going for 10 years and they are the most popular uh, jobs board plus startup accelerator for, for small businesses in the UK, I'd say. Uh, our mailing list is half a million people and we've been onboarding everyone onto Bubble uh, this year. And we're up to almost 8,000 users using Bubble technology. So when people say to you, can this be done in no code? Uh, can no code scale? Can bubble scale? Um, well, we, we're proving that it can scale and it's been a tough journey, but it's been an interesting journey and I've, I've learned a lot really. Um, and I've learned interesting things like how to structure your database for scale because how I used to structure my database in bubble was a bit different and I've learned some stuff that actually doesn't scale at all. Uh, so there are particular techniques. Anyway, let me carry on. Um, you've got my social, anyone wants to send me an email or, uh, or hit me up on Twitter, you've got my, my details there. Oh, looks like. Gregory might be frozen. We'll give that a second. I'm a countryside dweller as well, so I can I can sympathize with the uh, Wi-Fi connection. We should be. I should be back now, right? Yeah, cool. Sorry about that. I, um, you know, I run boot camps uh, three three times a week, really, in coaching, and I don't usually have these problems. Let me carry on though, because I was jumping onto talking about uh, what we're going to be covering today. Um, let me just start again on the slide. So, design principles in general, because basically, I find that a lot of 
no code developers are also new to design uh, and new to to design principles, digital, that kind of thing. We'll cover some of that stuff and then how that actually fits in uh, in the bubble editor, which is obviously its own unique space. We'll be looking at what I usually do is just create a simple style guide before we get started. Um, James, I can see you in there. I'm going to, I'm going to steal some of your ideas around a style guide. And uh, we'll look at responsiveness in, in the editor as well, of course. That will be the bulk of this session. And responsiveness, not, not just about around groups, but around elements. Repeating groups can be a bit of a challenge. We'll look at a landing page layout, which can scale from a desktop size and larger, and then down to you know, a small iPhone, uh, iPhone size. We'll look at a tactic for refactoring for a mobile version, because Bubble actually gives us the ability to clone a page, create a mobile version of that page, and then point, um, then connect the two pages. So if someone is on their mobile, they get served the mobile page. Now this is useful sometimes, particularly people that um, design pages that are very interactive. If you have a very interactive page, a mobile page obviously is usually a stack of columns, uh, you know, on top of each other, one, one column stacked. And desktop pages are obviously much wider and you can stack up to eight columns or so. So sometimes it's better than trying to squeeze a desktop page down to a mobile phone, particularly if the interactive page. It's just to design a different page. Okay, there are other things to think about mobile, such as if, if I have repeating groups that are, um, that, that basically stack in rows, maybe on a mobile version would want a horizontal scroll. That seems to be the, the most popular design layout for mobile. Um, and other things about mobile are things like if you're using inputs, you want at least 16 uh, pixels uh, in text height, otherwise your page will zoom in. So if you're using 14 pixels on the desktop, you'll probably want 16 pixels. Um, so that's a little tip for anyone struggling with pages zooming in on mobile, you need at least 16 pixels. So there are a few reasons why you would clone a page uh, and then make it a mobile page. Now, if there's time, I've been getting requests for a dashboard layout. Um, so I can show you a very basic version of the dashboard layout that I would knock out basically for every app I create, right? We all need a dashboard, an admin dashboard of some sort. We need to monitor our users, uh, run certain processes. So we all should have admin dashboards. I think the tendency of admin dashboards is to sit in the bubble editor itself, uh, which we shouldn't be doing, sitting in live mode in the bubble editor, editing our data there. And that's not really the use case for, for the backend data area in bubble, although I will still nip in there occasionally and do it. But we should really be building. Hello. I'll carry on. We should basically be building the tools um, on an admin dashboard and not sitting in live mode in, in the database. All right, um, let's jump in. We've got a fair amount to cover. So let's just talk about what happens when we create a new page in Bubble. So if we look at the page size and a common question I guess is, Greg, what width do I start with? And, and what height do I start with? And what I'll say is height doesn't matter so much. Uh, it matters a bit more if it's a mobile dedicated page, but your height's dynamic. So you just keep adding height um, as long as you need. So I'm going to set this height to 1600 because it's not important at this stage. I'm going to uncheck fixed width. Pages shouldn't be fixed width. Okay, pages, browsers are fluid. So I've never kept that, uh, that, that box checked ever. That's, uh, uh, that, that's a feature we don't want on a, on a responsive page. Now the width. Now I'll give you a backstory to width because if anyone is with us today, I recognize a few names and have done an older course of mine, maybe two, three years old. Uh, I've, my width size has evolved over time. And I used to set, I used to start with a width of say 1440 because I was trying to design for what I assumed to be a common uh, device size, which was, which was um, basically a MacBook, MacBook Pro 15 inch 
And what I've learned over time is you can't design for any size. You know, the next most popular MacBook is going to probably be the, the 16 inch MacBook, but Hey, we could be on any phone, any tablet, any device, PC, Mac, it doesn't matter. We shouldn't be setting up a page with that fits any kind of device. It just needs to be responsive and work on, on all page sizes. 12 AC for me is the page size. Um, and I know a lot of good designers I speak to, such as James is in this session, is 1280 works for him as well. That's sort of his starting, starting size. Now, this is an interesting size to work with because you probably will recognize page width sizes of 320, 640, 960, 1280. Those, 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 are, those are widths you sort of recognize, and there's a reason for that. If we jump into the responsive engine, 320 is quite small, okay? 320 is quite small. Now, 320 is a bit of a pain in the ass, particularly if you're new to responsive. Um, but 320 is an iPhone SE, the original iPhone size. If you've got an iPhone 12, you've got a bigger version of the iPhone SE. They've, they've adopted a similar design with sort of the flat structure. But 320 is an iPhone SE, the most popular phone that's ever existed. Such, such a popular phone. Um, I think I have three scattered around the house in various drawers of mine that I've just kept over time. Great, great phone, but absolute pain in the ass to design in. Uh, 320 is a very small canvas size, but we have to take that into account. Most Android phone sizes started around 360 and up. Uh, I, iPhone X is 375, uh, new iPhone 12, I think is 414. So we're getting bigger and bigger, but 320, smaller size. We can't ignore the size. We have to design for the size. So I've set up a page size of 1280, but let's have a look at this section here. Cause it says 320, but there's a little clue next to it, which says 25%. Okay. So we know 25% times four is 100. So, we, so we've now, we can divide our canvas into four parts. Um, and those four parts are all 320 each, which means we can actually create breakpoints on the canvas. Really clean breakpoints using a 50% min width strategy. Okay. So basically what we're talking about now is page structure. And we're going to get to dropping these groups on the page very soon and having a look at how we can get them to break. But before we go there, I think for people that are new to design again, uh, I think there are a few of us uh, new to the no code space. We need to think about structure. Now bubble, this is, um, it depends on the context, but this is probably a good or a bad thing. Bubble made the decision to give us a blank canvas with no structure. If you jump into Webflow or any other no-code tool, probably all, all of the no-code tools, I haven't used all of them, uh, if I'm honest, but probably all of the no-code tools give you training wheels, they give you structure. They say, here are the boxes or here are the containers or here are the divs, create your content there. Bubble didn't adopt the strategy and um, pros and cons, if you're new to design, this is definitely a con for you because what happens is what I see is people set up the page width and then immediately go for some text and they start trying to find, uh, you know, work on their H1 title. Then they'll grab a button and they'll put their button and the button will be slightly off axis. The X value will be, you know, a few mil out because it's a drag and drop canvas. Now I don't personally like drag and drop. Um, I still use drag and drop, but this is the area that you want to be working in down here. These X, Y values, this is the gold. It's not drag and drop. Drag and drop, basically take the element, drop it on the page, but be careful with dragging elements around. These elements need to sit inside containers, whether it's a group, a repeating group, a group focus, they need to sit inside containers. They can't just hang out uh, individually. Let's just look at page structure. 
let's let's just think of page structure now. Let's forget about color and uh, design for a second. Let's just look at page structure or HTML, because after all, Bubble is spitting out HTML for us. Okay, they're spitting out HTML, they're spitting out CSS, they're creating the JavaScript, but we're giving the instructions. We are giving the instructions. Now we need to give correct instructions because all browsers, they all speak the same language. So this is not some magic bubble language where we can just throw elements on a canvas and magically it will be responsive. So what I'm seeing up here is one big hero image, one big block. I'm not worried about what's inside uh, this container. I'm gonna call it a group. Let's use bubble speak tonight. Let's call this a group, one big group. We could say that those eight elements are in a repeating group. Okay, two rows, four columns. We see another repeating group um, of four columns. If this wasn't a repeating group, it would be basically four groups all, neat, all, all neatly laid out. And we have, our, we have our margin between them, all nice and neat. One big group or row with smaller groups within. Three columns in a row. That's what we need to look at when we're looking at design ideas. This is where we start. Do a similar thing with Uber. Uber's hero image is divided into two groups, left and right. These will probably both be the same size. The content is inside the groups. This is grouped here. This isn't floating in its own space. This is grouped. This would basically be our repeating group. This is just one giant big row, one, one large image. Three column repeating group. Two groups left and right. Got three groups and footers are interesting. I see people struggling with footers because they can be tricky. We've got a four column footer. If anyone is new to bubble, I, I think you might be struggling with how on earth do you make a four column footer responsive? Because it just wants to jump all over the place. And there is a technique for this. This is achievable. So the moral of the story here is Bubble doesn't provide structure. We need to create it ourselves, okay? I'm gonna get around to that. We're gonna, we're gonna jump back in here a second. But let's also talk about um, basically a style guide. Because the other important thing is in the inspector, and I think we're all guilty of doing this. Remove style. Right, let me start playing with style. Let me start playing with color. Okay, I found color. This is my H1 uh, text. Then we go to a new page. And then we take the text, we drop it on the page. And then we also need H1 text here. So we say, okay, let's type some text, H1 text. What do we do? We remove the style. And then we think, what was it on the previous page? Uh, I'm too lazy to look. I think it was 22 pixels in height. And I think the color was black somewhere. Line height, I think was 1.2. And I'm guilty of doing this as well. Uh, I have to say I'm guilty of doing this, but this, this is not how we design. This is not a, this is not a, a consistent way to design. And for a number of reasons. Number one is inconsistency. Number two is your CSS file will start becoming giant. Now Bubble creates a CSS file for us and that will start gaining in size and will actually slow down page load. Uh, Google won't like it and you'll get penalized by Google uh, because Google look at page structure, file size, all this kind of thing. So you don't want to do that. The third reason is, and I've learned the hard way, is you work for five, six months, then you decide you need to change uh, your hate file, but then you have 50 pages and your client now wants a slightly different color black, maybe that black. And then you have to go and find every single part, place where this text exists. This is why the style section exists. And this is what we should be doing. It's fine to play, uh, to go through the process of discovery, 
figure out what works, but you need to be saving this stuff back to styles and editing styles. And it's okay if you have three versions of your H1, maybe it's left aligned, center aligned, uh, maybe it's light and dark, that's okay. That's better than a hundred H1 elements across different pages, much better. So let's talk about a style guide because this is kind of the first thing you want to get, get together. Not one of the first things, but it's something you need to get together, get together very early on. Okay, I'm going to remove the style. I'm just going to go through my process here. So at minimum, I mean, I, I usually do this. I usually have H1, H2 uh, and H3. We've got my version of black. We've got slightly lighter charcoal. And then we've got lighter again, gray. You copy and paste and just choose body for this. Maybe my body is 16 pixels and it's back to black again. So I suggest creating this on a separate page when you begin with, maybe on a scratch pad page or maybe create a page called style guide. And this is where you wanna jot down your style guide and uh, just stop playing with it. Once it's finalized, then you can go back new style or edit the current style that, that Bubble has provided for you, okay? And these are generally most of the colors, uh, the, the darker colors that I'd use. Now, we see obviously H1 is a larger text and the text size is getting a bit smaller. Maybe this should be slightly larger. Let's give it a 28. Um, yeah, we'll bold that. But we can see that there's a cascading color style here as well. We use color for priority. We use color because color jumps out before anything else. Before an image, color, uh, your brain recognizes color. Uh, before structure, before words. You know, words probably, come, words probably come last. I'm not saying they're not important. But use color to draw attention to parts of the page. I'm going to borrow uh, my mate James's um, uh, technique for basically working out brand color. So what we can do is just drag in just a little group, okay? Um, just a little fixed group. And then go to the process of discovery of what colors you're going to use. And to quote James, less is more with color. Less is more. This is where I see people getting into trouble because color is a really powerful thing. So if I pick this as my brand color, then I might have an inverted version of this or like a fade of this color. Maybe this is an inverted button. This could be a login button. This could be a sign up button. What other colors would I have? Well, I might have a red, red for danger, red for delete, the big red button. And that's really it. There's not too much more color I'd add to my application. There really isn't. And if you go around and look at some of your favorite applications and websites, providing it's not like a design, like if you look at Webflow, they've got every color in the rainbow, but they really know how to use color. Uh, but look at Apple. Apple is just shades of black and gray. Very, very minimal, uh, and they might use color and buttons. Okay. Don't get carried away with color. The other nice thing about using colors correctly uh, and in a minimal way is colors also can become your brand. That pink, this pink color with Airbnb 
if I see that pink color anywhere for any other brand, I'm just like, that's Airbnb's color. You can't, you can't steal their color. That's the color of trust. That's the color of discovery, travel. That's the color of dopamine. Because I know when I'm on the website, I'm getting excited. Uh, I'm going to be traveling soon, hopefully. I don't see much other color on this. The color comes from the images. That's where it should come from, because that's your dynamic content. Okay, lots of color here. It's an illustration. That's fine. But look at the buttons. We've got, we've got white, black, gray. We basically have this palette I've just done, except for I've chosen green. I can't use the Airbnb color, unfortunately. We're going to move on very soon to responsive, so don't worry. Black, gray, white. Uber doesn't actually use color. So let this be a clue, folks. Let this be a clue. We need to attack this with, with a, a minimal approach. And this is basically good news. This is really good news because this makes our life easier. Okay. Let's just go back to this design principles. All right, let's move on. Let's go back to the, oh, and we've done style guide as well. Let's go back to page structure. Before I continue, Julie, I see a few things in the chat. Are there any questions? Uh, nope, a couple comments. Um, cool, good, good thing. Uh, James isn't giving me any trouble either, which is good, he's, he's being a good lad. Not yet. <laughs> Cool. All right. Let's, let's continue. Let's continue. So in the make a pair challenge, this is going to be one of my criteria when I'm evaluating some builds, use of color, use of style. It's got to be minimal and uh, don't get carried away with color. Let's go back to the page because we've got 1280 width, 320, 1280 divided by 320 gives us four parts. Fantastic. What a great starting point. Bring this further down. Gregory, now we're dealing with uh, one question popped in. Um, sure, go for it. Marielle asked, how long do you recommend students should spend on a, a style guide in the early stages? Yeah, great question, Marielle. Thank you for that. I think a style guide is something that just um, will evolve. It needs to be fairly early because it informs the design, uh, the design of your website. Now, or of your application, sorry. Now, if you leave the style, if the process of discovery continues for weeks and weeks and weeks, well, now you've got 10 pages to go back and restyle. So it's very tempting. And again, I'm speaking from experience. It's very tempting to get that idea and go, fantastic. I need to build an app for delivering food. Let me jump in straight away and start building out the functionality. That, that is fine. But, um, but I like to look at the competition, see what they're doing. I like to look at other successful companies. They have done the work for us, really, if you think about it. There's something called, uh, I think it's called Jacob's Law, which means that if there is a leader in the space doing something interesting, or if we're all used to Facebook Messenger, um, sending DMs on Twitter, using Airbnb, these are the leaders in the space. If we start going against the grain uh, with less impact, um, we're going to be discounted straight away. What I'm trying to say is we, we shouldn't try and reinvent the wheel with these things. And this work has been done by successful companies and you will be judged against successful companies. We don't launch applications saying, go easy on me, I'm a bubbler, I'm in the no code space. You launch a product and if you are doing a marketplace for, for, um, for travel, Airbnb is your direct competitor day one. So don't try to reinvent the wheel. Look at what they've done. They've spent hundreds of millions of pounds on UX. Take what they've done. You can borrow it, adapt it. If you want to be truly, truly unique, I'm afraid it's not really on the UI side 
or on the design side. The unique part is probably on the UX side. How do you deliver an experience, the overall experience? And to go back to answer Muriel's question, you, we want to be getting students to think about this quite early on in the, in the process. At least have a page dedicated to a style guide. Uh, and when you start to become more confident in your decisions as you're building out maybe a landing page, go back to your style guide, record it down, um, and just work that way. But we don't want to leave it too long. Thanks, Barry. My pleasure. Okay. Let's set up the page structure. This is something we should all do now. This is the boring part. And this is something for me where every bubbler can make headway in, 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 in strides. You can make headway in strides here. Now ignore what I'm doing by removing this style because I'm just creating some colors on the page, which will just uh, act as groups. Um, let's actually do everything this way. Let's say this is, let's give that, let's do 20% here. It's going to copy and paste. Let's give it a different color. 20%. Okay, 320 fits into 1280 four times. Fantastic. So we've got four columns. Okay. Earlier on, we looked at some examples in Airbnb and Uber where they had four columns. Well, this is where you put the content into. Let's get another group. Because much like my mate James points out, uh, we're chatting the other day and I said, hey, James, what's the, what's the number one tip you would give to uh, no coders, especially getting started? And uh, his direct response was margin and padding. Why don't I see it anywhere? Margin and padding. Now we don't really see these words, margin and padding used in Bubble. And again, Bubble gave us a blank canvas um, and decided that we need to figure this out ourselves. Okay. So we create the margin and padding. It's not created for us. I think there is po possibly one location that you'll see the term padding, if I drop in a text element, and I tend to ignore it. Uh, over here, we have padding here. Okay, but you won't see this, you won't see padding mentioned um, with most elements. So just ignore that. We're going to create our own margin and padding. Now, I want 320 pixels um, of padding within here, 320. Sorry, I want 20 pixels. If this element is 320. Um, first of all, I'm going to position this at an X, Y value of 20 and 20. So then this needs to be 280. It needs to be 280. I'm going to do the same down here. I'm going to drag it to approximate location, and then I'm just going to add on the amount of pixels more I need. I find with picking up and dragging elements is fine if you're moving something to maybe a different position on the page. But if you're using, if you're working on a small section of the canvas, you kind of want to use, like I mentioned before, this section down here. This is how we get precision or pixel perfect designs. Okay. Now we can put our content in these boxes. Let's just drop in a text element, give it a number one. Let's do 30 on that guy. Center vertically, no, let's do 70, nice and bold. And I'm going to it's going to center vertically, center horizontal center horizontally on this. Okay. I'm doing this because I'm going to illustrate how these groups break down to a 320 pixel size and all stack neatly in the right order. So I'm going to take this, copy and paste into this, this particular area here. 
Let's change the color back to this pink at 10%. Change this to two. Now notice on the group itself, I have a minimum width of 20%. Um, I'm just gonna leave that for now. I'm gonna come back and deal with responsive. I'm setting up the structure right now. The responsive settings will come second. But we don't want fixed elements to begin with. There is a use case for a fixed element, such as putting a button that's half the width inside of here. Because if this group is fluid and we start to scale it down, well, the button will scale down from this position. But I'll, I'll come to that. Let's not jump ahead too much. Okay, and let's put in the last one. <laughs> kind of struggling with this bar. Where can I put it up there? All right, there's fine. Center horizontally, center vertically, and let's do four. Now, what, let's see what just happens if I hit the responsive tab. Let's just see how this behaves. So we can see that it's completely fluid. It's completely fluid. But it's getting quite small. If we had um, text or images or elements or buttons in these groups, this is not really the, be the behavior we're after, is it? I mean, it's getting way too narrow. So at this stage, now we look at the responsiveness. Now, I'm not too worried about what's in this group at the moment. I am, I'm most concerned with this parent group. Let's call this group one. I'm mostly concerned with this. And this is where I'm going to set the responsive setting is on the parent group. I'm not going to start playing with responsive settings down here. I'm going to make sure that that is out of my way. How do I do that? I just set it to a minimum width of 20. You can set it to 10. You can set it to one. It's not important at this stage. What's important is this parent group. I'm most interested in how this reacts because anything within this group inherits, inherits those responsive settings. Now I gave you a clue earlier on where I said that if I bring this down to 320, we've got 25%, 25%, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna hit 50% on all of these parent groups. I'm hitting 50% min width, the minimum width this group can squeeze down to before the elements to the right will start to drop beneath, will start to break. Basically, we are playing with break points here. Okay, there's a reason why that big gap is there. I'm going to get to that. We'll get to these gaps in a second. It's because they're not grouped in a row. Uh, but if you look, this is very small. Maybe I can zoom in. Yeah. So you can see 320 pixels. If I go one pixel smaller, we've got a break point at 320. We're at 640, 50% of the page width. We've just broken. Okay, this group, I'm going to fix this in a second, but that's another breakpoint. Now, the reason why these are um, jumping around the page is basically they need to be grouped as well. Group elements in a group, and I'm just going to drag this down to create just a bit of area that I can hang on to it with. Okay, this isn't, we can see where these breakpoints are. That's all very well, but this four group is 
full width at this stage and now we've got three times small groups. Let's fix this. And you guessed it, we're going to create more groups. So now I'm going to group these two guys on the left in a group. And I'm going to group these guys in a group. So we get to 440 on the left hand side here. And we've got our breakpoint at exactly 640 pixels. Let's continue down. Down to 320. I think I need to set 50% on this group as well. And 50% as well. So you can see that this is quite, quite straightforward. I'm not fighting. I'm not sitting in the responsive editor, moving things around, uh, creating increments of uh, min width. I'm not creating increments. You can see it broke at 320 there perfectly. So we've got our breakpoints. What I used to do is I would sit in the responsive editor and I'm at 50% and I'll just play with this back and forth, back and forth, 54%. When is it going to break? When is it going to break? And it will be breaking at arbitrary points. It'll be breaking at 851. And I'd sit there for days and I'd think, ah, oh, why isn't this working? Why isn't this working? Well, the reason why it's not working, folks, is not your responsive editor. The reason why it's not working is because the structure is incorrect. Another tip I'm going to mention is and I'm sure James, Mariel, and, and some of the people I've, I've, uh, I've taught before is think of yourself as a chef. If you are new to the no code space, uh, think of yourself as a chef, you're new to cooking. Are you going to try open a restaurant and create a Michelin star uh, menu and create these beautiful dishes that are outside of your ability and then, and then customers are going to come in and then try rate you based on these promises you've made. You're going to go out of business. Start, start simple. Look at what you cook at home. Cook up something simple. I like to think of this as uh, creating a recipe on a page, creating, and then creating a menu as an app. Keep it simple. I love to see some of the, the designs that are pushed out of Webflow, but hey, Webflow is doing, they're creating the structure for you. The reason why you, you can get all of these uh, uh, elements that overflow and different z-axis is because they do all of that structure for you. Most of it, all right? You still got some design decisions. Bubble is a blank canvas. Go, e go easy on Bubble. Go easy on yourself. Let's carry on with this. But we need to keep it simple. If this is a good, uh, good point to ask some questions. We got a couple questions in the, in the chat. Yeah, let's do it. Um, Mike and Steven, um, are curious about, is it possible to keep the integrity of the square rather than squash things into a rectangle? Um, no, it's not. It's not because we are dealing, well, yes, I can make it all fixed width. I can make these all fixed width, um, but that's not how a browser reacts. Uh, if you want to create fixed width elements, well, there wouldn't be side by side down to the pixel. You'd have to create some space. Um, let me just demonstrate this. This is easier to, one of these easier to show than tell kind of things. Now, what, what, now in terms of these squares, I know what to do here. This is going to answer the question a little bit better because I don't want to draw too much attention to these squares. I want to draw attention to content. I want to draw attention to content. The squares are in there just to demonstrate functionality and breakpoints. Let's get this down. Yes, there is a way to retain group size. They have to be fixed width, but then you have to deal with empty space in the row which we need to create a little workaround for, which is putting 
uh, groups between groups. Uh, and I'm going to demonstrate that after this uh, H2 text. Now, this will probably, let's make sure, right, we have 20% there, 20%. Drop this in there, drop this in there, drop this in there. Now, although we start designing with blocks, we do need to preview how it will really look, okay? Um, this is the result. This is the result. Obviously, you know, I'd probably change, I'd collapse a bit of height here. Um, well, the text isn't spanning all the way down here where it should be, but this is the, the result I'm trying to get to, is the colored blocks where the structure it wasn't the content. So those colored blocks, I don't want them to be perfect squares, fixed squares, because, you know, that doesn't make sense in terms of what I'm trying to achieve here. I'm trying to achieve a design that works on a desktop size um, down to 320. Let's do this. Um, and this yeah. was actually part of the session. This is part of the session. Um, actually, before I continue, I'm going to come back to this. Because Julie, do we have other questions? There were a couple other questions. Yeah. Um, Kyle asks, because the group needs a handle to hold on to, is there any way to remove that padding it creates when reducing the width? Yes. Yes, there is. Um, it has implications though. It has implications. Let's take this group here. Now, I have, uh, within this group, we would say that between the dark green and the light green, that is in fact margin. If I'm talking in context of the elements here, this would be padding. Now, let's just see the width of this. The width is 280, knock of 40 is 240. So I know what Carl is trying to achieve here. And this is when we collapse margins. This is when we collapse margins. So if I hit the responsive editor again, what I can instruct this group to do, down here, we have collapse margin when container width is smaller than or equal to. So I can say 640, now we've collapsed, collapsed that particular margin. Um, we still have this 20 pixels. So all right, let me, let me work on what, what Carl is aiming at here. So let me, let me reduce let me reduce the padding down to 10 pixels, which means that we left with 10 pixels uh, when we were on a phone. Now, if anyone follows the Apple design guides, Apple uses 16 pixels of margin between the edge of the phone and content. That's, that's sort of standard. Some people use 20% pixels, um, including myself. I'm just demonstrating 10% pixels. So if we head down to this size, because I've collapsed, I've collapsed these margins at 640. All right, that, that, that just needs to be a larger size than this particular group at the moment, which is 300. So, you know, I could set 350 is fine. Does the same thing. If I remove this, we are back to this group here. But if I add this back, what we're doing is collapsing the margin and we are just pushing it all the way to the edges. And now we're left with 10 pixels padding on either side. So Kyle, the area you want to be looking at is your groups have to be set up correctly, of course. But then if, if you want to collapse, if you want to collapse your, your uh, margins, then just make sure that when you drop content in a group, there is some padding between the content and the edges of the group. And then you can use the collapsing strategy. 
Gotcha. All right, any other questions? There was a related question um, and then two other ones as well. Sure. The related question is, do you okay. mind demonstrating if one of the color blocks has longer text? One of the colored blocks has longer text. Well, the text is just going to uh, wrap beneath it. It's just, oh, I see, I see, sorry. Who, who asked this question? Marielle. Marielle, okay. Marielle, I think Marielle actually knows, knows the answer to this. <laughs> but it's, it's a good question for others to learn, of course. Um, what if one of the, uh, it's a little bit too much. So I think what Mariel is pointing towards is probably dynamic text, because if this is dynamic text, if users are submitting this text, then we can't always control, we can, but let's pretend that we don't have that much control over the amount of text someone submits. Maybe these are perfect examples, something, something I tend to show uh, on applications is um, feedback, reviews, or biographies. Those you probably want to display on a marketing page. Your marketing page is mostly static information, but you might have a repeating group or uh, a repeating group of option sets with dynamic text. Um, various strategies we can use here, various strategies. But let me, I'm going to just fill the space because otherwise it won't be obvious. When you drag this down, drag this down and just fill the space. And look, if I was, if this was static information and this is information I had, well, this is, this is a UI decision that you need to make. Um, if you are displaying this as static, well, then I will make sure I type the exact number of characters that I want, just so the groups don't produce variable height text. Okay. Um, so we can see this is a bit longer, but let me chop off. Let's make these all variable to make it a bit more fun. So these are all variable heights. Put that one there. Yeah. Okay, now we are pretending that this is dynamic. The users have submitted this. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't set a max number of characters or min number of characters, which I truly believe is the way to tackle these problems. Instead, we went ahead, we let people just produce these large biographies and now we're stuck with this design. Oh no, what do we do? Various strategies here, okay? One of them is, uh, let me try to get to it. Shrink if text gets shorter or cut off content of too tall. Now this is, how do I describe it in the best language possible? I think this is kind of a confusing sentence. Basically what's, what we are doing here is looking at the text element height, not the text itself. We're looking at the element height. This is the text element. Don't worry about what's in the text. This is the text element. Quite often I see this, I think Mary will see a lot of this as well, is by uh, new, new designers. They'll drop a text element, put some text in and then leave all of the space down here. Leave all of the space down here. And Bubble will, will, will create that space in your design and you'll have this huge uh, vertical height with nothing in it. Um, let's have a look at how text actually functions in, in this particular text element, because I think it's kind of an, um, an underserved part of design and bubble is working with text. And I see problems all the time. This actually segues really nicely into something that uh, I was chatting with James recently about a technique he uses for the text. And the technique he uses, James, if you don't mind me borrowing this, is if we're talking about 16 pixels uh, of font size. Now what James does is he always creates line spacing at 1.5. 
okay? Now, if I drag this text element down slightly, I've just created some vertical padding here. That's what I've done. I've created a vertical padding. This is not how we want to do it. What we want to do is let's use 1.5 line spacing, which is, I feel like that's sort of an adopted good design practice. If your text was giant, say 60 pixels, well, we wouldn't use 1.5 line height because then you got 16 pixels of space in between. That's too much. Okay, we'll probably use 1.1. But let's go back to 16 because this is a neat little trick to calculate the, the height of your text element, not the text, the text element. So we take 16, we times it by 1.5. So basically, if we halve 16, that gives us eight. So eight plus 16 is 24. Now watch what happens. If I give this an arbitrary size, if I make this 24 pixels in height, the text has come back to its position and we've got perfect padding all around this text. And when this text grows, because that's, that's, that's basically what it does. Um, let me preview this. Let me preview this page. Okay, this text is going to grow. It's obviously pushing this down because it's keeping that, that vertical padding, but the text element itself will be rendering really nice and neatly and nice and tight around this text. And it's not going to have extra padding beneath it by the lazy practice of just dropping a text element on the page and just hoping that this text maybe fills the space, maybe it doesn't. Um, and the text will start to render really strangely if you, if you don't use this technique. If this was 18 pixels, 18 pixels times 1.5 is 27. So I'd use 27, okay? If it was 24, you can just keep going with this. Maybe you'd times 24 by then, well, you would times 24 by 1.5 to give your text element height. So that's how I'd handle that. Uh, so that's a neat little trick for text element height. Now, let's go back to what we we're doing earlier, which was just filling the space here because we want to retain some of the design. Um, so the one strategy I had, uh, is cut off content. If the element is not tall enough, I use this all the time. I use this because people submit different amount of text and maybe I just want to preview a certain amount of the text and leave the rest. And what I've done here is if these were cards, neatly presented cards in a repeating group those cards would retain the same design. That's exactly the same height. That's where I would cut off content uh, if text is too tall. If I'm using cards, which we all use these cards in repeating groups. So that's, that's a really nice way to deal with that. Now there's a reverse problem to this in that we can also use this strategy. We can also remove when, um, Sometimes when a page is expanded out, we have another text element problem because the text element height remains the same, but the width increases, which means you get less rows because it's getting wider. We can actually close up the text element, which means all of the groups beneath it will also creep up and we aren't left with awkward space. Let me show you in this group here. Um, let's just see, you can see here how this vertical height, this vertical height here has been exacerbated. We've got more vertical height as we've gotten wider. When I squeeze the page down, it starts to fill that space. So that almost looks better now, but as I'm contracting out, things are getting a bit awkward. Uh, Within this, within this particular section of the session, um, obviously this looks fine as is, but I'm just going to show you how to deal with that. And that is in the responsive editor. 
if we shrink, if text gets shorter, we click on that. And then let me refresh. This is particularly useful when we're dealing with single columns. And we, if, if we have time, we're going to get to this because if I had a mobile phone design and it was stacked with groups on top of each other, this is the feature that I want. I want this to close up as the text gets shorter. So the two tactics here is cut off content that is too tall to retain your nice neat card design. So then some of your repeating group cards aren't longer and shorter and all variable widths. That ensures that you are showing um, a consistent design. What about this UI problem of not seeing all the text? Well, maybe create a pop-up where you can view more. That's, that's an adopted uh, particular UI technique. That's totally fine. Then the other thing to deal with is if text is to, if we expand the page, um, we get less rows of text, but the text element height remain, remains the same. Well, then we shrink and we pull up. Those are the two tactics there. Now, I want to move on to, and please don't, don't look at these boxes and think I'm trying to create these perfect size boxes. The boxes are just there, the groups are there just to demonstrate the structure on the page. Um, Julie, if there are no more questions, I'd like to move on to a question about retaining perfect squares on a page. Are there any more questions? Um, there were two more that are maybe a little bit more general, so we can leave them for the end. Okay, um, ask, ask it now and I'll try to answer them while I'm building this out. Okay. Um, what is your advice for Perfect. designing mobile first? It still seems easier to do it desktop to mobile with this approach. Oh, I know what James would say. Um, mobile first. Now mobile first has, could mean different things to different people in that we live in a mobile first world. If you're building an internal tool at your company, something that your colleagues will be using or just your company, you should see some of my internal tools, horrendous. They're not mobile first. If you're creating a consumer facing application, something that you don't know who's using it out in the real world is consumer facing, well then mobile first, yeah, of course, mobile first. But if you're talking about the technique of mobile first, this is how I built. I load up a 1280 canvas, this is how I built. Um, now, why do I build this way? Um, because I divide the page up like I've shown you and I know what it's going to look like on mobile. And this is after all a canvas. It's a canvas like someone's creating a painting. Now, if I go paint the harbor, I live across the road from a little, uh, I live in a little corner to village with the beautiful harbor. Um, I'm not going to go take a canvas this big and just take a tiny brush and try like paint this thing. Uh, no, I'm going to take a bigger canvas uh, that, will make, that will help me really get my ideas on the page. However, the whole time I'm doing this, I'm going to have in the back of my head, how is this going to look on mobile? And there are various tactics I use, such as the one I've just shown you how to divide up the page. Let's continue though, because I'm going to show you how all other group uh, numbers of columns can divide down. We haven't covered three, which is more awkward, and we haven't covered two. Two columns is basically probably one of the most popular and a single column. So let's, let's continue. What we're gonna do up here is create a, what we'll pretend to be a header, okay? Header would naturally be in a floating group. I'm just using a standard group because I wanna demonstrate how you retain squares, how you retain squares if you ever need to use squares. So I'm gonna take a group. Let's pretend this is our logo and we've got a square. Um, I'm going to make that, so we've got 80. All right, let's do the 60 by 60. And let's give this a bit of color. All right, so first things first, uh, let's make this 20 X value to center it vertically. So this is our logo. Naturally, we would have right-hand side as well. This would usually be a bit wider, but let's play with some squares for a bit because this is fun. Uh, okay, same settings. Now, if we just look at this responsively very quickly, 
what's happening is jumping over to the left hand side. Very simple fix. We want fixed width and fixed margin right. Okay. Now we're dealing with squares on the left and the right hand side. This is an easy one. This is an easy one. How do we do three? How do we do four? How do we do eight squares? Let's start with three. Copy paste. Center this vertically. Let's have a quick look at the responsive editor. How is Bubble going to treat this? All right. So this isn't going well. What about if I try to deal with this empty space here? Because we've got just we've got this sort of floating in the center. But what about if I take a group? Just push it up alongside there. I mean, what I, what I should really be doing is dividing this into three parts, but I'm just showing you another little technique I use uh, of how, how we should try in a row, you want to be filling up the space. You don't want to be leaving, leaving big gaps, okay? So I'm going to set this down to one pixel of minimum width. So the smallest it can shrink down to is one pixel, basically, all the way down. It will be slightly more than one pixel based on the, uh, the width of this element. I'm going to do the same on the right-hand side. Now let's see what happens if I start squeezing this down. There's your phone. So now I've got three perfect squares, and they are all in the position that they should be in. Now this particular technique um, you know, what is the correct way of doing this? <laughs> what is the correct way of doing this? Well, the correct way of doing this is really just put that in a group, divide the canvas into three parts, uh, center this in this group. I'm just going to do this sort of very lightly. This would be in a group as well. And basically all the group sizes would be exactly the same. This would be fixed margin to the left. This would be in a group as well, fixed margin to the right, and then this would be in the center. Um, and then would make sure that this can squeeze down. That's really the correct way to do it. To do it. But I thought I'd just demonstrate that, call it a little hack or something, uh, that little technique with just filling up the space with other groups to get around the issue of uh, three or more in a row, because I know that, that pains a lot of people, uh, particularly people that end up deleting the default bubble footer to create your own. And then you think, how on earth do I do three or four in a row because I deleted the bubble element. Um, and uh, that's actually a technique they use. That's where I learned it from. So that's how you obtain your perfect squares. Now, obviously for a logo, that's fine. Um, this would most probably be, this will most probably have content in it, okay? Um, but what I'm trying to do is make sure that if I have three in a row is that I have three groups all butting up against each other. Let's actually, let's move to one group, two, let's do one, two, three, and then we'll keep our four because there might be slightly different techniques for each one. Okay, yeah, this is quite a straightforward one, of course. It's going to do that. We all know how this works, but this could also be divided into two parts. This is to, um, so yeah, what do we got? Six, 640 each side. Now I'm going to set 20% to begin with. Copy paste. Okay, so this, this is, we've got our row. We've got our two columns. But we also need 
our content area. Let's not forget about our content area. 20, 20, and then this just needs to be 600. There's a content area. And there is a content area there. And I'm just going to make sure nothing's fixed with. Okay, that's fine. And I'm going to set this to 50% and 50%. And we can see that it will break nicely where it should, 640. Let's do three quickly and then let's, let's move on to the next sort of section of the session. Let's do three. Three is a little bit different, okay? Because 1280 doesn't divide into three parts. Let's get this up here. And let's just copy paste this guy down here. So I'm gonna get my calculator out here. And what I'm gonna do is make the center group probably a few pixels wider than left and right to make up for the division of this. So if I say 1280 divided by three gives me 426. So I'm gonna say 426 for this. 426, uh, I'm gonna copy and paste this one here. Let's start at 426 for this. We're gonna be putting different types of content in these boxes quite soon, don't worry. But I can't hammer the, I can't hammer it home enough that we need to set up structure before we start playing with the design. Okay, so we've got a bit of space left. So I'm going to say three, two, eight, I think it is. Uh, bring that across. Yeah, three, two, eight. Sorry, folks, I know this is a little bit boring, but, um, but this, is, this is where the magic happens, okay? You get your structure right, you're going to have an easy life. You're going to end early on a Friday, have a beer, have a glass of wine and think, wow, that was easy. Just got my structure right. Responsive design doesn't need to be difficult. Why is in this? Oh, I'm doing height now. Um, eight six. There you go. Three eight six. Three eight six. Three eight six. And then we're going to look at how content. Uh, how elements respond responsibly within these groups. Let me actually leave this one a bit lopsided here and we'll see what, how it reacts. So three in a row, all right. So far, not good. Let's do 50. It's because I didn't group these. And I think it's because It's actually furnace in here, just turning it down. Group elements in a group. Okay. So this is, this is slightly different in that because we've got three in a row, our division doesn't quite work how we'd like it to work. Uh, cut off content of too tall, let's neaten this up. Three in a row presents a few challenges. So now we have two in a row and one in a row. And I think this is actually okay. This is okay for this to happen. Uh, and I see it everywhere that the breakpoints are a little bit more awkward and it's not going to correspond to the breakpoints with an even number. So as much as possible, whenever I'm creating groups on a page, I will do three in a row sometimes but I always try to do things that are divisible by two. So two, four, six, eight groups. Um, and then if I can take eight groups and group them in groups of two, if I can get everything down to left and right, that's, that's much, much easier to do. Okay. <clears throat> so 
we can ignore this up here now. Uh, this was 386. Let's talk about elements within these groups now. Because another thing, um, Julia, I see often is basically h1 text um, lorem ipsum. Let me go back down here. I see this. The ipsum word has broken beneath the rest of the sentence. But it doesn't need to do that because we have space on the right hand side. Okay, we have space on the right hand side. We need to use this space. This space is reserved for this text. This text could be variable width. So don't shorten, don't type, don't do what I've done now, which is type a certain amount of text and then match the element to that amount typed. We could make this fixed width, but most of the time, and that's fine, um, but if this is dynamic, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work because this is going to wrap beneath it. We need to span all the way to the edge, all the way to the edge. Because what's happening is if this group is 50% min width, well then that's going to shrink down and it's going to start your text element at this position and then also shrink from this starting point and also shrink this down 50%. So that means this text element at 50% is going to look like this. So that 50% of your group is inherited. You want elements in your safe zone, in the safe zone box. You want to span that full width all the way to the end. Now, when don't you want to do this? Because there are times that you don't want to do this. All right, obviously text, you want that full width. Or you might have a button. You might have a button. And maybe one strategy is that. I think we had 20. Let's just remove this. Um, this 10 pixel padding in here, because it's easier to demonstrate like this. This is when it's okay not to span the full width. And maybe the sign up button, you don't want it to span full width because at this particular position, well, it's getting ridiculously long now. That's too long. So this is when it's okay to say, all right, let me set this at about 150. Now I can check fixed width, absolutely fine, because I know that this group is only going to shrink down to 50% here. It's only going to shrink down to the center, and this is going to be uh, unaffected by that, by that particular behavior. It's going to be unaffected. So that's, a, that's when you would use fixed width. Another time you'd use fixed width is because maybe you have a button on each side. This one says log in. And then this would be fixed to the right hand side. So you need to be strategic about the element width. And I think text can get confusing because your text element is invisible. You don't see it. You don't see your text element. And maybe, maybe be more strategic while you're learning and give your text element some color just to remind yourself that now we've got a gap here, but this is reserved for this row. Just to remind yourself, pull it all the way to the end. Set min width the 20%, 10%, whatever. It doesn't matter because your responsive settings are set at the parent group. This is good news for us because it means we don't have to sit here and figure out the responsive setting for every element in the group. We just full width, span that full row, uh, set responsive on this particular element, the parent group, and then go have that beer because you've done all the work. It's going to work out. You know it's going to work. You know it's going to work. So it's just simple math. It's simple math. All right, any, uh, any questions before we move on to the next section?
Um, there was one more question. Um, I read in the next updates that Bubble will use Flexbox. Do you know anything about that? Uh, yeah, so I got a bit of tr uh, in a bit of trouble trying to tell everyone about Flexbox and don't worry. And uh, but the, yes, it's going to happen. There is no um, no particular timeline for this, but it, it is, I believe, Q one. So any time before, um, I, I suspect it'll probably be in March or so. And don't let that be a reason. I suspect you all are doing the challenge, but don't let that be a reason not to learn because having you have an advantage now to understand page structure. Um, and that will help you when Flexbox is rolled out. But, but Flexbox, I'm, I'm excited about Flexbox because Julie, this, this is the no code space is usually serving new designers. And I think Flexbox will, will make everyone's life easier and it will stop Webflow users from saying a oh, bubble sucks with design. Uh, I'm excited for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm excited too. Um, but, uh, but I think it's a good idea personally because we need training wheels to begin with. And I think Flexbox serves everyone. It serves the professionals and it serves the amateurs. Uh, and, and, and it will definitely make all of our apps look that much glossier, which will be nice. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll see. No timeline on that, but it's definitely happening. And awesome. I'm pretty excited. The new editor is also being rolled out. Uh, the alpha is happening in the next few weeks, actually. Um, James, Mariel, make sure that you're in the alpha for the editor. And then I think that goes to market that, that the beta will probably start maybe in February, end of January, February. Complete new editor redesign. Um, but it basically, it's a reskinning. Uh, and slightly different positioning of certain things with a few other features, but uh, but uh, there's nothing stopping. A few people said to me, I'm going to wait for the editor's design before I learn bubble. And it's kind of, you know, the, the, the usability is the same. It just looks nicer. It looks yeah. nicer. Okay. Let's, let's carry on. Let's see what else is on my list here. There was a couple more questions or there's, yeah, one of yeah. course is, uh, Please, is when it. are you doing a workshop? When am I doing a workshop? Yeah, which definitely like you should absolutely check out uh, Gregory's right now. Uh, build kit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you should check out Gregory's website. Um, he's got a lot of really awesome tutorials on it. Definitely Gregory's been dropping all sorts of knowledge on us today. And um, he's got a lot of awesome content that you should definitely check out. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a lot more content coming when the new editor is released. Um, and uh, I've got a few collaborations that are pretty cool coming up and we're going to see some interesting stuff in the new year for sure. Uh, and, uh, and I want to, I want to convert those Webflow naysayers to bubble users. Basically that's, that's my goal for 2021. Mariel, please help me with that. James, please help me with that because, um, I think that there's going to be a land grab going on very soon. Uh, bubble, basically, you know, people, if I can just riff for a while on this idea of competition in the no code space, which I think is a little bit silly because these no code tools serve an array of people. Okay. I, I really love glide. I think glide is fantastic. Glide is, has heavy training wheels and so does Adalo, uh, and I, but I think I have their space and they're brilliant. Webflow I feel is built for designers and is better for creating sites. But hands down, there is nothing quite like Bubble. There just isn't. There are a few tools that are as powerful, um, but they don't have the community. Uh, and the community is necessary um, to drive progression. I don't think you can do much with no code tool without community. And Bubble has nailed the community. And I don't, I don't, I can be honest, I don't use any other tool. People, Webflow users, and I'm not attacking, attacking Webflow users. I feel like I've been attacked over the years. <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, I see people talking about Webflow stacks or WASM stack and they get the t-shirt and yeah, that's cool, man. But, but what about bubble stack, one stack? You know, you don't need member space, member stack and all of these stacks. Bubble does everything. And uh, I think when Flexbox is released, a new editor, it's going to start attracting a lot of designers because designers, you know, I'm a designer myself and I love pretty things. I love shiny toys. When I first uh, created a... I was a Webflow user to begin with, but when I created a Bubble account, I looked at it and I was like, 
I can't bring myself to look at this ugly UI. And nothing has changed since 2015. It's still exactly the same. <laughs> but they have invested time and effort and money into progressing the, technolo the technology under the hood. And it's so far ahead under the hood. And now when it's going to get a reskin, it's going to be an amazing place. It's going to be so exciting, Julia. I, you know, I can't, I can't wait to see what happens next year. Um, so, so we'll see. Um, will Bubble overtake Webflow on the design aspect? No, it won't. That's not their objective. Their objective is just to be better than they are. Webflow will always have its space, and, and I think Webflow is an amazing community. And it's just Webflow and Bubble are so different, in my opinion. They're so different. Um, yeah. So. I'll stop there on that front, but Flexbox is coming, new editor is coming. I've been looking at this white canvas for so long, I can't wait till dark mode is enabled because I think I'll be more productive in that space. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm really excited, I'm really excited. Me too, and I'm really excited to um, create some awesome tutorials for MakerPad as well um, with all the, yeah, new, definitely. the new dashboard will be really cool. Um, and we have one, totally. one more question. Um, that I'm really also curious about. Um, what is your approach to using design tools like Figma or Sketch and importing the complete design to Bubble rather than designing the whole thing in Bubble? So I've done both. Um, and you know, it's, if you, my, my answer is this, uh, and I suspect Mariel gets this question on a boot camps um, because Figma is a popular tool. And my answer is this, if you don't use Sketch and you don't currently use Figma, don't use them. Don't use them because you're gonna be spending time learning how to use Figma and Sketch and you're gonna be wasting time not learning how to use Bubble. If you're an absolute wizard in Figma and Figma you can design in 50% faster, use Figma. When you import it, there's gonna be reconciling to do um, and it's not gonna be a perfect import Will it get to that stage? I don't know. I don't know. Now, I don't, you know, I still use Figma occasionally when I have an idea and I quickly want to sketch something out and I don't want to produce a, a new app uh, or I don't want to sketch something on a page, but I'm quite quick, I'm quite fast in Bubble. Um, I've seen James whip up stuff in Bubble faster than I could ever whip up stuff in Figma. So it gets to the, it gets to the point where if you are quite skilled in Bubble, stick with Bubble. Uh, Figma, I don't think, or Sketch is going to save you that much time. If you are going down the startup route and you work in a team and you're going to present uh, wireframes for your idea to investors or it's going to be in a pitch deck, do it in Sketch or Figma. Create that little interactive piece. Um, but I don't see a use case for Figma or Sketch given that Bubble is so fast uh, and if you work alone, I just don't see how it's going to, I don't see how it's going to save time. And I don't know about you, Julie, but time is my biggest commodity. Um, and, uh, and if, if I can somehow save time, then I will. And I think starting on a bubble canvas is where I save my time for sure. Yeah. And that's something, um, that in my background with web development, um, I find extremely powerful about no code tools, particularly bubble is that you can kind of do design and the functionality at the same time um, that you don't need to break it into those two parts uh, like you would in a typical yeah, yeah. That, development process. Yeah. That that's uh, that's a great way to put it actually, because um, in the past when I've tried to work in a team, um, I've approached it various ways. I've thought, all right, well, why doesn't this person deal with the design side and I, I'll deal with some of the functionality, Julie. And then I've discovered, hang on, to render this repeating group, well, I need to create the functionality and get some data in. So then I need a form to get the data in to render the design I've just built. And now, but now I've done the whole thing. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it's all done at once. You're designing and building and putting data in the database and creating option sets and doing everything at the same time. Uh, and going back and restructuring your database to get the, your, your repeating group uh, to, to render how you want. So, so that's my answer there. But, uh, but I, I'd like to push on because we actually haven't talked about repeating groups. Yep. The most powerful thing about Bubble, really. Okay. 
before I quickly do that, I did want to just show um, a little tip from James in terms of something he, use, he has pinned in his browser. And that is when you want to do some calculations on a page, ideally you adopt what I've taught you. 320 times four gives you 1280 in those particular breakpoints. If you have pages that are, I don't know, maybe some of you have a page that's 1600 wide. If you want three columns with 20 pixels of margin between them, use this tool. Use this tool because it'll give you the group size that you need together with your margin and padding. Um, so grid calculated at DK. Uh, since James tipped me off about this, I've had this open. Um, but I've pretty much learned most of the sizes I need now. You can see I was struggling with, with three groups earlier. I don't know that one off by heart, but I, I will soon. Um, but this is a nice little tool. And also I tweeted about this recently, but man, I've been using, some of us use Chrome. I use Brave browser as well. Uh, but I develop in Safari because I think that their developer tools are incredible. They really are. And they're just cleaner to work with. Now, Chrome developer tools are great. The Chrome responsive engine is fine, but I'm not interested in seeing the HTML and all the code and, and the DOM stuff. You know, if I hit this, look at this amazing responsive tool we have built into Safari, just accessible in a different tab. And I have this open time. Right, you can set your own width here. But you need to get into the habit of not just using the responsive engine here because this doesn't render everything you need. If you want to render, render your, your true data, enable Safari, uh, this developer tab. I'm just going to show you where to do it because it's kind of hidden. In preferences in the advanced tab at the very bottom, it's got show uh, develop menu in the menu bar. This is where it's hidden. And I discovered this by chance because it's, it's hidden. And I haven't really seen anyone using this responsive tool here. Julie, what do you use for your, for your work for responsive? Um, I personally use Chrome, but I, I mean, I use Chrome as my um, browser and I have it set up in my very particular way. Um, and I just use, they have the, yeah. the responsive tools in the Chrome developer tools as well. Um, yeah, but. they do. Yeah. And if you do more sort of native coding stuff, then obviously that's more useful for you because you can see a preview of that. But for those of you that don't need to see all of the underlying code under the hood, hop on over to Safari if it's available. I look at this. This is a, this is, this is amazing. And I can, and you know, everyone, keeps talking about these other browsers that are, because I've used browsers that are responsive tools, but I don't want to run another browser. I just want it in a tab. So, um, so yeah, tip. Right, we've got 20 minutes left, and I just want to uh, show a quick demonstration on repeating groups, because one of the things I see in repeating groups is the data doing this. You shrink down the page and just everything bleeds into each other and is like misaligned and uh, people try to create headers and then the headers are misaligned with the content beneath it. Let's look at this. All right, I've got a repeating group. Now, I've got some data in the database, just users. I'm just going to go do, do a search for users. Let me make that full width. I'm going to create more space here. Let's grab uh, an image element. Now I'm going to make this the current users. Do I have an image? I do have an image in here. And I'm just going to quickly set this up so it's a perfect circle. And those of you that have done my tutorials know that you don't need any special cropping tool for a perfect circle. Um, you just have fixed width perfect square to begin with. Set the roundness at least half the height is 20. You can set more if you want. Set run mode rendering to stretch because I'm going to use process with image IX, which is a third party API image rendering service that is built into bubble. And I'm just going to check this box that says resize to fit the dimensions by cropping. So I've created the dimensions, the square, I've then made it a circle. I'm going to check this box which means that the image is going to zoom in slightly and then fit this perfect square because dynamically 
users upload squares, circles, rectangles, uh, all sorts of funny shapes and sizes. Um, and we all, if we want a clean design, we want to render those nicely into a square. Okay, so no fancy tools needed. But um, I'm not going to harp on this technique because I talk about it over and over in my tutorials. Let's get some text in here. Let's make this current user's full name. All right, I'm going to adopt James's strategy with 16, 1.5, which means this needs to be 24. Uncheck fixed width. I'm going to do this as I'm going along. Now, names are dynamic, basically. So I'm just kind of guessing at this stage the width of the text element. I'm just guessing because later on I can refine that. Um, I'm going to use job title. This one, copy and paste. This one I'm going to say email. Email is naturally a bit longer. And finally, I'm just going to say uh, created date. And we're going to reposition all of these elements. I'm just getting them into approximation, uh, approximate positioning at the moment. And this is just created date. Uh, let's just give it some nice formatting. Okay. So create a date, I'm going to fix to the right hand side, okay? So I can use a full width. Create a date, yeah, something like that. I'm not too fussed at the moment. All of those in there and I've unchecked fixed width, I think for all of them. Okay. Now I'm going to set the Y value of, let's do, now let's do 35 for all of them. Y value of 35. 30, no, that is the responsiveness. That is 35 and this is 35. Okay. Now the typical thing to do is to add little uh, titles above these elements because it's not always obvious what we're looking at. If we're looking at a date down here, well, what, what date is that? So we need little title tags. So if you don't know this particular technique, what I'm going to do is just drop this in. And from a responsive design point of view, we want these title tags to, to move responsively uh, with the text beneath it and not, not to do this, which is what I see all the time. So what have I done here? I've dragged in a group. Okay. I'm going to drag in a group and I'm going to put it in the cell. I'm just going to bring all of this stuff down slightly. It's a time, 15 minutes. Okay, that's enough time. I'm going to drag in a group. I'm going to uncheck fixed width, of course. Fixed width, very rare would have fixed width, especially on a span all the way across. I'm going to go to the conditionals tab and I'm going to say when the current cells index is one, because every row in your repeating group is assigned an index uh, starting at one. And we say when it is one, then show this group. Now if group collapsible, which I'm gonna do now, it means that it will show in the first cell and nowhere else in this repeating group. And then we can see our title. We don't want the title in every single row, just the first row. Okay. Now I'm going to take text and I'm going to just position it above this text here. And I think this was the full name. I'm going to uncheck fixed width because what I want to do on this is make this sort of a gray color. Uh, I'm not worried about line spacing here because this is on a single row. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the text beneath it. There are two things I'm interested in here is the width of the text, but three things, the width of the text beneath it, the X value of the text and the minimum width. And I'm going to match that with this text element above it. Now the typical thing I'd see here is, all right, fill name. We don't need that much space. I'm just going to do that. And this is where the, because the responsive engine uses mathematics. 
It doesn't look at a page and decide how to align your elements on the page. It uses math. So what you need to say to yourself, well, if it's going to use math, then surely if I want these elements to move together, then I need the same width, X value, and responsive. They're going to work together on a horizontal row. So 163, 67, and 20. Perfect. Then I'm going to move on to the next one. I'm just going to do this very quickly because the clock's counting down. Uh, while I'm doing this, Julie, shoot with any questions that are left over. Um, Lola wanted to see how to create a repeating group with fixed records nested in another repeating group with fixed records. Mm, repeating group nesting. That's not quite a uh, responsive design, but um, you can put repeating groups within repeating groups, basically, and you can just keep keep doing that uh, till the cows come home. Um, and that really, so I've got a repeating group here, and what I'd do is grab another repeating group, put the repeating group in the cell, and then as long as this repeating group shares a link to a table with this repeating group, well, then you can access the current cells user. Maybe this repeating group is a repeating group of skills. Then I can access current cells users skills because skills is a list. Skills is a list. So I can put a repeating group in this repeating group cell and then every single cell will have a list of skills within that repeating group cell. All right, so 126, 244, 126, 244, moving on. Copy, paste, almost there. Now this is 200 and 390. 200, 390, got lucky at that one there. What do we have here? Uh, this was the email. So even though I'm using short words, it's the text element that's important here, the text element itself. All right. And then this is the 239 by 600. So 600, 239. All right, almost there. This element here, I also need something in there. So I'm going to create a spacer. I'm going to create a spacer. And the reason why I'm doing this, if I don't create the spacer at fixed width, the same as this, then these header items are going to overshoot the mark and move more to the left than what's beneath it. Okay, so this is 34 fixed width. All I need to do is make this 34 fixed width. It's purely a spacer. It's not a saucer, it's a spacer. And this is the creation date. And I'm going to swing this across to the right hand side. That's email. All right, let's have a look at this. We're going to break out of the development tools. Okay, so we have a new challenge here. We have the job title isn't quite long enough. All the um, the text element could be prob probably long enough, but this is okay because we're going to cut off the content when this happens. But as you can see, all of this is aligned perfectly. It's all aligned perfectly. Let me get that back. Oh, I've lost this. Where is it? Okay. Let's carry on with this because we do have a few challenges. So job title, I'm going to check this box to cut off content if element is not tall enough. Um, I'm going to do it for all of these. Remember, we're doing the same to everything. 
you can't treat this element in the cell differently to this element in the group because we want the same behavior. That's a bit ugly to look at. So what I'm going to do is just remove the uh, separator, separato. Naturally, I'd have a max width. Let's actually do that. Let's set a max width because this is trying to stretch way too wide out of the max width. Okay, I've lost my email. Let me just refresh at this width. Where's my email gone? Email aside though, we have retained that positioning, okay? We've made sure that we've got the same starting X value. We've got the same width of the text element. Let me just reiterate that sometimes it can be helpful just to train, just to train your mind. It can be helpful to sometimes color these elements just when you're building out just when you're building out because this is what bubble cares about they care about the elements and not the content in the elements is there a way to not have those labels um, repeating with each piece of data oh yes they're repeating i apologize so they're repeating because it's visible on page load <laughs> of course that's the one thing i tried to actually demonstrate and i screwed up there uh all right so yeah so now it's um it's only showing when the index is one gotcha cool thank you okay so i hope that was helpful obviously we've got repeating groups in different shapes and sizes sometimes we have groups and repeating groups to show cards various strategies around that to show cards of the same height. Remember, I illustrated that you want to cut off the content. If you want a perfect height card, you're dealing with dynamic data, you have to be in control of that dynamic data. Two ways to do that. Either you constrain the amount of text someone can input, someone's creating a profile, give them 280 characters long, then design your cards around 280 characters long. A technique I prefer though, because people are usually lazy, and, uh, and uh, we'll do a one-liner is find middle ground with that. You know, I'd rather a shorter text element and then cut off content if, if text height is uh, whatever wording they use here. It's a wording. Cut off content if element is not tall enough. I only ever read the first two words because the rest of it is like, oh, yeah, sort of the sentence. I feel like uh, Bubble have created their own language for sure. Um, and that's how you get your really beautiful width ways repeating groups. Um, so there's no need to no, just be wary, excuse me, just be wary that if you have fixed width, just set anywhere. Let me demonstrate this. If you have fixed width, I'm sure we all have experience with seeing designs like this. that happens. So much like when you are, uh, well, this is a terrible combination, but I remember when I was doing uh, coding in a syntax editor, you know, you'd leave that comma uh, and you'd have to go find that comma. Well, when you're dealing with a canvas, um, it's those little, little details such as having a checkbox checked by mistake or having one pixel out having one pixel out in one or two locations means that when the page stretches wide, well, that one pixel turns to two pixels, turns to three pixels. And then your design gets worse and worse, the wider or narrower uh, the page gets. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop there. I think I've covered a lot. Uh, we've done structure of the page being the most important lesson. We did a quick style guide. Um, we looked at things like use of color at the beginning. And when it comes to judging Judging the, uh, the challenge, this is something we're going to be looking out for is color, structure, typeface, consistency, consistency and delivery. 
Um, and some of these lessons we've learned today, such as dealing with dynamic data, dealing with text height and all that stuff. Um, it's all super, super important. can't be overlooked. We are the no-code generation, but I want to see us delivering work that looks as good as the native generation. Absolutely. I think I'm done, Julia. Are there any more questions? Uh, there was one, one more question from Mike. Um, stepped away for a second. Is the repeating group responsive down to a small screen size? No, it's not because I would redesign this repeating group for a small screen size. This is obviously what I've got here is one, two, three, four, five columns here, Mike. This is the perfect. Now there are various strategies for this. I could use a conditional to show and hide this repeating group based on the width of the page. I could say when the page width is smaller than or equal to 960, uh, that's his 690, I'm a bit dyslexic, then, sh then hide that repeating group. And then I could use the opposite conditional to show a smaller repeating group because naturally repeating groups on a mobile phone, you're not gonna have more than say three pieces of text on a row. You would probably squeeze in two, to be honest. If you think of the width of a person's name or someone's email address, will probably span full width of your page and you want your text to be legible. You want your text to be at least 16 pixels on a mobile phone. Um, and I'm definitely erring on the side of larger, larger text these days. Um, larger text, simpler designs, but executed perfectly. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the way I'd go with that. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, I hope that was useful. That was uh, extremely Feel helpful. <laughs> yeah. Feel free to um, join me. Join me on Twitter. Um, I'm just going to also, uh, very quick, I'm in the wrong thing here, but I think James, um, James, could you remind us now, in my opinion, the strongest designer I've seen in Bubble is by far James. Uh, and we have James here today, James Moore. So please follow James because he gives, he pushes out a lot more design swag every day than I do. Um, I'm more of an all-round guy and please follow James because I think he's got a wealth of knowledge and I think he's going to be a huge credit to the bubble community going forward. James, what's your, what's your Twitter account? Oh, he's typing in the chat. Perfect. So definitely have a look at that. Um, jump on Twitter, have a conversation with me. Here are my details down here. Um, and you can reach me at Greg at buildcamp.io. Um, Time is my greatest commodity, so I'd prefer if you join my community and chat to me there, but I'm open if you want to chat as well. Uh, many cool stuff, lots of free resources at BuildCamp, and, uh, and James is on there as well, helping out. He's a good man. Thank you very much, Julie. Hope that was awesome. helpful, and uh, I'll see everyone on, on Twitter, on social, and looking forward to the challenge. Um, know that I'll be looking out for the structure. I want to see the structure in place. Definitely. Thanks so much, Gregory. This was a super, super helpful workshop. Um, and even in my, my coding brain, I'm thinking, wow, like, oh, I wish I knew this kind of stuff going into the front end design. This is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And folks, we will uh, post and the recording of the workshop um, on the event page. And thank you all so much for being here. Thanks, everyone.